डॉक्टर रितिका यस या डॉक्टर दीपक कैन यू हियर मी ओके डॉक्टर रितिका यू कैन स्टार्ट शेयरिंग द स्लाइड्स Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of BLK Center for Child Health and IAP Central Delhi, I, Dr. Swati, welcome you to this BLK Telepeds webinar on food allergy in children, current situation, and challenges in India. As we know, food allergy is quite common in West, and most of the data and research also comes from the Western countries. Uh, it's not that it does not exist in our country. unless it is associated with life threatening or acute manifestations it may go unrecognized and lead to significant morbidity so let us hear from the experts what is its importance in our clinical practice so uh, for this panel discussion to moderate the session we have with us dr ritika goel she is con consultant pediatric pulmonology allergy and sleep medicine at blk center for child health as uh, for the panel we have with us dr neeraj gupta he is pediatric intensivist and allergy specialist at sir gangaram hospital new delhi welcome dr neeraj uh, dr deepak goel he is pediatric gastroenterologist from fortis group of hospitals new delhi welcome dr deepak and dr ankit parak he is associate director pediatric pulmonology allergy and sleep medicine at blk center for child health over to you ritika for the session Hi, sorry. Hi, I am Dr. Deepak. Uh, I think I have some issues with my camera, so I am just trying to figure it out. I think you all can hear me. Yes, Dr. Deepak, <coughs> can hear you. We can uh, while you sort this out, we can start with the discussion. Over to you, Dr. Ritika. Thank you so much, uh, Swati, ma'am. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, let's start with the. uh the food allergies in children i think it is a very hot topic of interest for all uh, all the pediatricians since we are getting a lot of cases of food allergies and i hope we can sort out all the dilemmas and doubts that must be occurring in clinical practice so the key points in our presentation what we want to discuss today are understanding the different types of food allergies how do we go about diagnosing them do we have uh, adequate diagnostic tests available to us and what are the treatment options and the recent advances in treating food allergies so to begin with i want to ask uh, dr neeraj this question how common is food allergy in children so thank you dr ritika for the question and i would like to thank uh, blk max hospital and uh, your entire team for giving us this opportunity to discuss an important topic so this is a very relevant question that how common is food allergy in children so uh, with this i would like to bring to your notice that food allergy is maximum times perceived and so there is a difference between perceived food allergy and true food allergy perceived food allergy in the sense that majority of the patients or parents feel that either themselves or their children are having their symptoms related to certain food whether they are having any temporal relationship or not but they have a strong belief that yes this is associated with particular food and this belief is also uh, potentiated because of many regional practices many cultural beliefs which uh, you can say like uh, have a false belief that okay this particular child is having food allergy or this particular person is having food allergy so the perceived food allergy as per a estimate in india is somewhere up till the tune of 16 to 20% whereas the true food allergy if we are doing certain testing and then we are labeling it like a physician diagnosed food allergy so it is somewhere up to the tune of like 2 to 3% so it's not that high as compared to the perceived food allergy a very good point there uh, sir that in uh, food allergies are often report the reported number of cases of food allergy as per the parents is much higher than the actual uh, food allergy incidence so let's look at some data now food allergy affects approximately 2.5% of the world population however there's a 
wide range of prevalence in if we see the data it's from 1 to 10% in USA 4 to 6% of children and 4% of adults suffer from food allergy now this is diagnosed food allergy and not parent perceived food allergy in India we don't have enough data but from whatever we have food allergy is reported to be 0.14% uh, in children and 1.2% in adults CMPA is the most common food allergy reported, uh, reported world over and the incidence is around 10% in the world and 3% in India. So my next question is again to you, Dr. Neeraj, and what are the different types of food allergens that cause allergies? So uh, usually it is said that any particular food item can practically cause allergy or theoretically cause allergy. But uh, there are common eight food items which are worldwide or globally considered to be the main culprit allergens. So these are the most common one are the milk, egg, peanut, and then they are followed by some wheat and soya. And then uh, you can say like some uh, non-veg items like uh, the chicken and the shellfish, fish, all these items are there. So, but I would like to say that this, if you just see the regional distribution, so the regional distribution in a particular area or a particular geographic area might not be same. So in India, we cannot say that these are the eight food items which are common to us but there are certain other newer food items which are more prevalent here. And among these eight, there are certain food items which are less prevalent here. Globally, these are the eight food items which are considered to be major culprit allergens. Very true, sir. The most common eight food allergens uh, world over are these. Peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, cow's milk, soy, egg, and wheat. 90% of food allergies are caused by these eight food items world over. But what, when we look at the Indian scenario, the order of uh, allergens also changes. And one important thing is that chickpea allergy has been reported to be very high. And chickpea is just one of the studies. Basically, legume allergies are reported to be high in India. Now, why is that so? Why do we feel that allergen sensitivity pattern is different in India? Probably because our diets are very different from the Western world. We follow a vegetarian diet and we have a very large uh, legume intake in our diet. These are the hypotheses that I could think of. I would request the panelists to also give their two cents on this topic, that why the allergen sensitivity pattern is different in India. There are different cultural practices. For example, in India, the groundnut oil is used as a cooking medium in a lot of households. Also, there is use of groundnut oil for massaging. So basically, our infants are exposed to groundnuts and peanuts at a very early age as compared to the Western world. And we, our children are not uh, exposed to processed peanut in any form like peanut butter or any packaged food items as compared to the western world these are some of the reasons that i could think of or find out that why our allergy sensitivity pattern is different from the rest of the world i would request the panel to give their two cents on the, this particular topic so here i would like to add on two points uh, ritika so one point is you rightly mentioned about that there are certain different food items which are there in india so in my practice which i have observed is that there are certain fruits which are also coming positive when and they are relevant clinically relevant to the patient and then uh, among the vegetables lady finger so it is coming brinjal so brinjal allergy lady finger allergy so these are also coming common in indian patients which uh, the data is lacking from the western world so we definitely require more studies we definitely require more work more focused work and then only we can come to know that okay which particular allergen is relevant here Regarding your this slide, so I will just put my thoughts and then we will listen to other panelists also. So uh, to my understanding, the, the genetics and the epigenetics, which plays a major role. So, uh, and then when it is coming in contact with the environment, now the environment will also include a lot of microbiota. So if you just go through the pregnancy time, not after birth, if you just go through the pregnancy time before you can say like after conception. So we have a uh, you can say like a cultural practice or a belief that the mothers or the pregnant mothers usually get, you can say like a nut rich diet, which we usually call like laddu or something like that. So they usually get all these ghee rich, nut rich diets. So the child is actually getting or the baby is actually getting exposed even in, in utero time to that particular allergen where the, the TH1 and TH2 pathways are still maturing. So that is also, you can say like uh, helping a bit. The second thing is somehow the microbiota. Still, it is considered that out of the 1.4 billion population in India, two thirds is still living in the rural environment. So there the microbiota is actually different as compared to the 
Western world or the urban settings. And that's why this particular microbiota might be protective and which is actually having some healthy uh, effects or uh, allergy protective protection effects which are there. So which could be another factor. The third thing you rightly mentioned about different food practices and the food processing. But yes, there are uh, certain uh, points which needs to be uh, further studied. Like for an example, it is said that foods when they are taken orally, so they are considered to be, uh, you can say like tolerogenic. Whereas food, when it is going through the skin, then it is considered to be allergenic. So if we are having a practice of massaging the infant with the coconut oil or the mustard oil, so they should be more allergic to coconut or the mustard, but which is not the case. So probably there is something which is more, which needs to be uh, pinned in between, which we still don't know about the answer. So these are my views, but I would love to listen to others. Uh, I th can I say something? Yes, sir, please, sir. So I think I think it is more related with the uh, genetics as well as the microbiota, as Dr. Neeraj said. Uh, I am not able to explain whether early exposure is a protective factor or a risk factor. Because I think theoretically there is leaky gut and if a kid or infant is exposed to the protein early in infancy, I think the kid should react more and the chances of allergy should be more. So I don't have any explanation, Dr. Neeraj, if you can comment on this. Like we see in cow milk protein allergy, uh, most of the kids who come to us and uh, who are on top feed uh, in, in their early age, they have this tendency to have cow milk protein allergy more as compared to kids in which uh, top milk has been started late. So I don't know whether it's a protective factor or uh, it is it a risk factor. I, I agree with you. I understand about in utero concept, but uh, whether exposure to protein in early infancy is a protective factor or not. So I, I agree with you, Dr. Deepak. So here, if you just see the slide, so this is the LEAP study. So LEAP study is something which is actually revolutionized the concept of at least food allergy uh, in the practice of allergy. So what it says, basically, so they have taken two cohorts uh, from different geographical areas. So in one geographical area, when they have seen that the, the food allergy prevalence, particularly the peanut allergy prevalence, this is much higher as compared to the other uh, geographical area. And then the genetically, they both groups were same. Then at that time, they tried to identify that which were the environmental factors which were different in these two areas. And they found that there was a, a food uh, practice which was there. I think Bemba was the food which was practiced in, that, in one particular region. Uh, which uh, the children were used to get exposed earlier, which was actually peanut-based food. And uh, that reduced the chances of peanut allergy as compared to the other geographical area where the peanut was exposed later, thinking about the same concept which you just highlighted. So based upon that, Dr. Gidelek, so this study was done by Dr. Gidelek. So Dr. Gidelek and group, they, they postulated a hypothesis that probably it is the early introduction which is actually helping or which is actually, you can say like, uh, developing a tolerogenic path as compared to the delayed introduction. And that's why the all the guidelines around the world, they changed for last seven, eight years, which earlier used to say about the delayed introduction, but now they used to say about early introduction. Simultaneously, I would also like to agree with you that there are certain more things which needs to be uh, understood, which needs to be, uh, you can say like filling the blanks because it is mm, not the entire, than, you can say like the every mm. uh, completion of the story. So the story is still incomplete. And as I mentioned you one point, that when the mustard oil or the coconut oil is exposed <clears> to <throat> life, why the child is not getting allergic to that if it is through the transcutaneous sensitization? So so then these all are hypotheses. Nothing is till now conclusive. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this is my point. This particular LEAP study was actually a big, uh, it, it actually revolutionized our thought process regarding food allergies, where we initially thought that the the big eight allergen should be exposed to an infant's diet later in life but uh, if we go by this study then yes peanut exposure early in life can be beneficial for these children however this study only has been done only for peanuts and no other food allergen has been studied in this way in such a big manner so we can't generalize it for all food allergens because we know that different uh, food allergens can have different uh, clinical um, presentations as well so moving on, 
why do you think the food allergy is increasing uh, world over and in india ankit sir so you're on mute so i think a lot already has been uh, discussed that why food allergy is increasing right and uh, uh, you know if you if you you know uh, visit a, an, an allergy clinic somewhere in the western world so i happened to visit saint mary's um, for a month for an allergy training and you know every second or third child which you see in the opt has uh, has multiple food allergies you know every uh, every third fourth child will be having peanut allergy and uh in addition what what uh, also is very prominent is that you know uh families which migrate from india right and they are living either in the us or uh, they are living in europe the incidence of food allergies is is tremendously high and that that actually proves that you know it is not just the the genetics which is important you know uh, we understand that you know there is there is epigenetics which is involved but i think the environmental factors are extremely important uh now uh, there is an hygiene hypothesis which talks about you know that if you uh, live in an environment where the horizontal and the vertical trans, uh, the infections are high they tend to be more protective now this hygiene hypothesis has evolved further and it talks about you know uh, it talks about that you know the the people who are living in an environment where infections are more common uh then they tend to have a more diverse sort of a microbiome both in the gut and in the lungs and there has been a lot of data which talks about how the gut microbiome actually impacts the microbiome in the lungs as well and that has actually helped us to understand that you know these changes in the microbiome uh, may be one of the factors which can explain why allergy is turning more common whether it is asthma whether it is food allergy uh, whether it is atopic eczema and so on and similarly similarly the this the severity of food allergies and the severity of other problems like asthma in india which we see uh, well the the delayed introduction of food already has been talked about and uh, uh, i think uh, this this is possibly one reason why nut allergy is is practically not uh, not seen or it's quite less uh and uh, and the leap study has proven it uh so i think these are the major reasons why and i think westernization of the the indian culture is is something which is you know leading to more of increase in the allergies uh, and we are you know we are yet to see the pandemic which the western world is 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 actually seeing as of now dr ritika uh, yes. with your permission can i invite dr p k vedantan here because dr p k vedantan sir is already in the uh, panelist link means he is in the list and uh, he is one of the allergy guru who has actually brought the concept of allergy and he is teaching a lot for past two decades to all of us so he is guru to all of us <laughs> so dr vedantan sir uh, uh, are you with us uh, can you hear me yes sir we yes, can hear sir. you good afternoon sir you are welcome sir hi hi thank you neeraj i was not really planning to be on the panel and uh, i just was very happy that you were doing this uh, webinar so i was more interested in listening to you all people rather than trying to comment but i just wanted to point out one i was listening about the peanut oil peanut oil comes in two different ways refined and crude refined peanut oil is not antigenic hence this can be easily very safely used in peanut sensitive people at all, uh, actually so so it is not a surprising thing that peanut oil is does not bother even in people who are sensitized to peanuts or who are allergic to peanuts as far as um, increasing food allergy overall actually we really have to look at the skin skin is as dr neeraj pointed out is the culprit more than the gi guard and this is exactly what happens in atopic dermatitis the people who you know uh, the persons or children or whoever the basic tendency in allergic individual is 
epithelial integrity is compromised. It's more so in these eczema patients. So the antigens enter to the skin, and this is where majority of the sensitization occurs. And also, a lot of the commercial lotions that we use actually are not good on the skin. And it reduces the natural moisture factor. And all these issues, we need to know that we need to pay a lot more attention to what is, what is occurring on the skin of our infants as well as in children more than what they are eating. So it is the skin which is the most, the dermatological uh, entry is the one that we need to pay a lot more attention as far as food allergy goes and that includes peanuts, eggs, milk, any of these type of things. <clears throat> so I, that is all I wanted to comment. Thank you, sir. Very warm welcome to our panel. It's always, um, we always learn something interesting from you every time that we get to interact with you and it's a pleasure to have you on our panel today. So uh, to summarize what we just discussed, why are food allergy increasing? Increased westernization where use of packaged food, preservatives, coloring agents, high fat, low fiber diets, ready to eat foods, all that has increased in India because of modernization, urbanization. There is reduced incidence of normal delivery. There is more cesarean sections happening in the Western world. The breastfeeding is going down to some level, more use of formula milk and increased use of antibiotics. All these things are leading to dysbio uh, dysbiosis, leading to our micro, uh, the protective microbiota that has some protective role against allergies is uh, kind of getting this, um, diluted with these practices these are that this is another hypothesis why allergy is increasing in india so uh, now i want uh, to introduce one case sorry Adiksha, can i comment one thing yes sir uh, more than food allergy it is the food sensitization that is going up yeah so it is very very high not food allergy. We really do not know the prevalence of food allergy in India. There has not been one study where the oral challenge has been done to say this child has food allergy. It is all sensitization or by history. So we really do not know the prevalence of food allergy in India. Very true, sir. So we have we had a one-year-old girl with history of anaphylaxis after eating a cake at a birthday party and she was rushed, rushed to the emergency section. Uh, what do you think is the culprit allergen here? Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Deepak. Uh, so I think there can be allergens and is like uh, so she is a one year old. We can't hear you clearly. Hello? Okay. Um, I, I think there's some technical glitch. I can't hear you clearly, sir. Can the other panelists uh, hear Dr. Deepak? There's some voice. I can just sum I think in the me meanwhile, I think, uh, Neeraj, sir, you can take up the question. So as the case suggests that one-year-old child uh, with history of anaphylaxis after eating cake on birthday. So, uh, so with this particular statement, we understand that there is something which is very acute, which is happening. So as we are discussing today about food allergy, so in context of the food allergy, yes, the cake is made up of milk. It is made up of egg. So we have to think about these things like a milk and an egg as a probable cause of, uh, you can say like allergic or anaphylactic reaction in this particular child. But if we think beyond food allergy, then there could be other possibilities, other possibility like because it's a birthday party. So there could be some balloon inflation. So there could be some latex, which might also be playing some, some role here. So what I want to highlight here is that do not keep your mind only to the food. You think broadly and entirely everything. So there might be certain other things which might also be playing around and which might be creating problems. Very good. I think, I think I'm back. Uh, Dr. 
Dr. Deepa, can you hear us? Um, what type of food allergy do you think uh, are we looking at in this case, uh, Ankit sir? So I think uh, if you have a child who presents with an uh, anaphylaxis, then what we are looking at is an IgE-mediated uh, food allergy. Uh, so IgE-mediated food allergy usually will present with... Uh, uh, things like urticaria, erythema of the skin, it can lead to um, swelling of the face, lip, tongue. Uh, it can lead to rashes, it can lead to vomiting, it can lead to uh, breathing problems, it can lead to breathlessness, bronchospasm, and obviously it, it can lead to anaphylaxis, which has happened in this case. All right, sir. So... We have two types of food allergies, the IgE-mediated allergy and non-IgE-mediated allergy. In the IgE-mediated food allergic reactions, they're mostly histamine-related reactions, so they are multisystemic. There are re reactions in the skin leading to urticaria, angioedema. Then respiratory allergies are also seen in IgE-mediated reactions. Gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting, acute onset vomiting, um, abdominal cramps. And even cardiovascular sim uh, sim uh, symptoms are seen like uh, fainting episodes or anaphylaxis. Whereas if we see the non-IG mediated uh, aller allergic reactions, in this the symptoms are primarily gut related. And these symptoms tend to change as the child grows up. So infants can present with diarrhea and blood in stools, which is the prime symptom. Then they growing up, they can have eczema, they can have failure to thrive vomiting, and a toddler is seen with tenesmus, abdominal cramps, and even constipation. So primarily the symptoms in a non-IG mediated food allergy are gut related. So in IG mediated reactions, we have anaphylaxis, acute rhinoconjunctivitis, urticaria, angioedema. These are primarily IgE mediated reactions. And non-IG mediated are contact dermatitis, food protein induced enterocolitis, and proctocolitis. So symptoms of these um, uh, inflammation of the gut are failure to thrive, blood in stools, diarrhea, food aversions, tenesmus, and even Hena syndrome is a non-IG mediated uh, food allergy reaction. The troublesome group is the one in, I've marked in the center, which is eczema. Child is always itching his skin, diarrhea, abdominal pain or colic, and vomiting. These are non-specific symptoms that are present in both IG mediated and non-IG mediated reactions. So sometimes it is difficult uh, to differentiate between the type of allergy just on the basis of history. I think, uh, can I add one thing? Yes. The most, important, the most important difference between IgE and non-IgE mediated is temporal relationship. Temporal relationship. Any, if the reaction happens within two hours after ingestion of the food, that... Mm -hmm generally is highly supportive of IgE mediated reaction. If the same reaction occurs like 12 hours later, probably it is not IgE mediated at all. So temporal relationship is extremely important. And as you rightly mentioned, skin manifestations are more common. It's 80%. 80% is first skin manifestation. So first thing will be rash, urticaria, feeling hot. And um, especially in a one year old to diagnose anaphylaxis is extremely difficult. The child will not complain or anything like that. So it is not easy to diagnose anaphylaxis in an only year old. So anyway, the temporal relationship is something I wanted to point out there. Yes, so thank you for pointing that out. So Ig mediated reactions are usually, they happen within minutes or within two hours of exposure to the uh, allergen. And in a Ig mediated reactions are delayed, probably starting from six hours to even three days. How would you investigate this child, sir, Neeraj, Dr. Neeraj? So as Dr. Vedantan has mentioned earlier, it is a history, which is most important. So in allergy, it's like 90%, 95% job is history. And that actually does the trick. And then the best investigation of choice after history is the challenge test, as Dr. Vedantan mentioned. But challenge, practically, it becomes difficult. 
So sort of that, then we try to take the help of some surrogate markers or some surrogate test. So there are two different types of tests which are available commonly to us. So one is the skin prick test or another is the, you can say like the uh, in, in vitro test, which is the uh, Ig based testing or the blood testing basically. So uh, do you want that? Should I elaborate these now or you will be discussing later? Yes, sir. In... Okay. Uh... So uh, I will give you an analogy. So the this analogy, uh, Dr. Vedantan has taught us. So the analogy is like that, that if a person who is coming to a hospital, like a BL Kapoor hospital, and uh, coming to hospital and asking the gatekeeper that I have to show to a doctor, then the gatekeeper might direct this particular person to anywhere. He can direct it to a probably orthopedic. He can direct it to a homopath, Ayurveda, anywhere, because everybody is doctor. So because everybody is doctor, so it is the story of total Ig. So total Ig can be raised because of n number of reasons. Apart from allergies, allergy is one of the reason of several reasons. So in India, it could be pollution, it could be gut parasite, it could be viral infection, post-viral. There are other different other reasons which are there so for total Ig to be raised. So it is neither sensitive nor specific for making or ruling out the diagnosis of allergy. It's very clear, right? Because the person's problem will not be solved if he is directed to any doctor anywhere. So then the second question comes that, okay, this particular patient says, oh, I need to show to my five-year-old child. Then now the gatekeeper understands, oh, it seems to be like a child needs to be seen by a pediatrician. So he directs this particular person to uh, the pediatric OPD and the child goes to the pediatric OPD or the patient goes to the pediatric OPD. Now this is the job of the specific IG. So the specific IG means that which particular allergen you need to, uh, you can say like target whether you are thinking about milk, you are thinking about egg, you are thinking about peanut. So you specifically talk about that particular thing and then you try to hit, right? So majority of the things, majority of the patients who come to the pediatric OPD, you, you treat. So general pediatrician can treat even simple pneumonia, they can treat even simple abdominal pain, they can treat even simple scissors also, meningitis also. The majority of the things they can treat, there are only small subset, only small subset which actually requires a very expert opinion, probably some DM pediatric cardio, DM pediatric neuro or something like that, which is like a super specialty. So the same way, there's a specific IG, majority of that time, it caters the need. But there are only few which requires extra information and that extra information will be done by looking at the components of that specific IG. Like milk protein might be having few components, some 10, 11, 12 components, egg protein might be having some different components. So there will be certain specific questions and specific scenario only, we'll be discussing that, but there will be certain specific questions only that then the CRD or the component result diagnostic will come, but otherwise, majority of the time, it is the specific IG which can do the trick, All right? Now, coming to the in vitro versus the in vivo, or the specific IG which you are doing in the blood, or the specific IG testing which you are doing with the skin prick test, what you are going to do? So, in uh, in a particular hall, if uh, I have to just count that how many people are sitting there uh, wearing the white shirt. So that means I can probably count like 10 people out of 100 are wearing the white shirt. This is like a specific IG, which is a IG. Free roaming people wearing the white shirt, it's like a free IG. On the other hand, if these IG, similar type of IG, two IG molecule sitting side by side together on a mast cell, two people wearing the white shirt, sitting side by side in the auditorium, then at that particular time, that actually detects the skin prick test. What I want to say, that the specific IG or the blood testing is more sensitive with a good negative predictive value, whereas the skin prick test is more specific with a good positive predictive value. But none of them is gold standard for food allergy. Food allergy gold standard is the oral challenge, elimination in the oral challenge. So, sir, in this particular case where we have a one-year-old with history of anaphylaxis and we have a list of three, four, five allergens that could be the culprit and we are probably looking at an IgE-mediated reaction, would you investigate this child? And if yes, then which test would you like to do? Yes, definitely this child needs to be investigated. Here, the child has presented to us with anaphylaxis. What is anaphylaxis? It is the extreme of allergy, extreme of mast cell degranulation. That means... The mast cells have already degranulated their histamine content. So I cannot do skin prick test at least three to four weeks before that, after the anaphylaxis. I have to wait for the mast cells to restore their, their granules back and then only I can do the skin prick test. Otherwise, there will be uh, false negative chances which are there. Second, there are chances that during the time of testing, the child might react once again. So I need to be prepared well enough. On the other hand, the safer side 
in this particular child, the, the free IG or the specific IG, the blood testing can, can suffice the need here. So we can probably do some two, three selected allergens, which we have just discussed now with the specific IG of those allergens. They will suffice the need in this particular child for now. Neeraj. Sir, sir, please. Can I comment one, sir, one comment? Sir, please. Yes, sir. Uh, the question comes, when do you test and what do you test with if you are doing skin testing? When do you test? You cannot test with skin test for three weeks after anaphylaxis. You know, you can't do it within within the first week or two because all the mast cells, as you were saying, just explodes and degranulate. There is no more histamine left there. And for that to reform, it couple takes a couple of weeks. So if you want to do skin test, you have to wait at least almost a month to do it. As far as what you test with, commercial extracts of foods are extremely unreliable. Okay. Extremely unreliable. So you may have a strong history, but a wrong antigen or a very weak antigen. So many times it is not unusual to have actual food itself, get the milk, get the egg product and whatever product that caused the problem, go ahead and skin test with it. A skin test with it, it may look crude, but it's definitely more sensitive than the commercial extracts. That's all I wanted to say. Very true, sir. So basically the skin prick test detects the histamine response uh, of the uh, activated mast cells to the food allergen. Uh, there are different, there are a lot of policies uh, associated with the SPT. Like first, sir has already mentioned, we don't have the standard food extracts available to us to do the testing, which are uh, uh, reliable. The wheel size at the time of the reaction does not tell us anything about the severity of the reaction or anything. It is just a positive test or a negative test. So if you have a wheel size of 5 mm and a wheel size of 3 mm, it basically means the same thing. Another uh, point is that skin, so skin reactivity should not be confused with clinical reactivity. Clinical history is the most important. We might do a test with, we, we might do skin prick test for 20 allergens and we get some eight or 10 allergens positive. That does not mean that all eight or 10 of them are causing the allergy. It just means that the person is sensitized to those eight or 10 allergens and what actually is causing allergy will be decided based on the history and unavailability of standardized food uh, extracts. Same, the other same, testing that test. is... It's same like meant to test. Isolated meant to test positivity doesn't mean tuberculosis. Yeah. You need some other corroborative evidences, either in the form of some history or probably some other radiological investigations or some other thing. Then only you can conclude that it is tuberculosis. Isolated meant to test positivity doesn't mean TB. It only tells sensitization. Yeah. Can I make one comment there? Uh, yes. During my training, that is exactly what I was told. That is, there is no correlation between skin test reactivity and clinical scenario. But in the past two decades, we have come to know there is a there is a relationship. The bigger the skin test reactivity, the wheel size, the chances of having a clinically significant reaction is very significant. Especially the diameter, if it is more than eight eight by eight millimeters, the chances of having are you the chances of you reproducing by challenge, a positive test around 95%. So the size of the wheel is very important. When you do the test is important and what you test is, is important. So we cannot depreciate the skin test because of these issues. And with this new data, skin test is very, very useful. It probably is much more uh, natural way of uh, testing than the blood test because when allergic reactions happens it happens with bound IgE not with free IgE mm -hmm. when you do the immunocap of the specific IgE you are measuring this free IgE when you are doing skin testing you are sort of imitating what nature does that is bound IgE bound to the mass cell if Neeraj you can comment on that if you want absolutely sir we, we, we discussed about that absolutely yes Coming to the in vivo testing, the serum specific Ig testing, it, the more than 0.35 units is considered a positive test, which is given by most of the commercial labs now. What I want to stress here is that a positive result just tells us how likely the patient is to react to that food item. However, he, it does not tell us anything about how severe the reaction is going to be. 
it does not tell us what quantity of food is going to cause the reaction and it does it cannot be compared between different individuals what i mean by that is one individual with a serum ig level for milk might be 100 and one one individual with a serum ig level of maybe 10 we can't compare we uh, a person with 10 might have anaphylaxis but a person with 100 might not have an anaphylactic reaction so what i mean is the value uh, that is shown on the test does not tell us anything about how severe the reaction will be whether the reaction, uh, what amount of food is required, and two individuals might be totally different. So two points I would like to head on here. So one point is, uh, Dr. Atika has mentioned very absolutely correct. So one thing is that, that whenever a person comes to you with a food allergy panel, which he has done because of some n number of reasons outside, and now he's bringing you with the report of probably 80, 100 allergens and asking you, the doctor, I am having 20 positive. So what should I eat and what should I leave? So what I can safely say is that those who are negative, the values who are negative, at least you are not sensitized to them by IgE method. So IgE mediated mechanism doesn't seem to be there. Those who are negative, so you can safely take them. At least IgE mediated reaction doesn't seem to be there. But those who are positive, I still don't know whether you are just only sensitized or you are actually having a clinical correlation to that. The second point is about the values. Yes, you are correct that 0.35, 1, 2, 3, they all are same. So they all are considered to be positive. But uh, literature also suggests that for different food items, there are different cutoffs as per the receiver operative curve, uh, which the people have studied. So they have seen like, for an example, milk. So majority of the time, if the values are 5 kilo units or more than that, then they are like nearly 67 to 70% of the time, they are clinically correlating. For X, they usually say that if the values are 15 or more, then they are clinical correlating. For nuts, they say that if they are more than 15 to 20. Similarly, for wheat or rice, they say 30 to 35 KU. So, but these are few studies. We require more generalization. As a generalized, whatever you said is absolutely correct that a absolute number doesn't tell you about the severity. Absolutely. So, good point, uh, Neeraj. Uh, the cutoff, those are called threshold values for specific IgE, one thing I want to comment is, I don't know who came up with that 0.35 units. And that has led to a lot of confusion. And it has, the value is so low and it is reported. That's why we have so many false positives with this uh, specific IgE determination because of this low cutoff. So I don't know why that 0.35 is given such a value, so that has to be questioned and probably has to be re-evaluated. True, sir. So the next question is for Neerat, sir, again. How would you select the allergens and would you do a panel of uh, allergens that are available in the various labs? So once again, the answer is that more you test, the more you will be in trouble. So you, you spend more time in taking the history go mm -hmm. in depth about the history, spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour to take the history, try to correlate, ask them for the symptom diary, making a symptom diary, that when the symptoms happen, last 24 hours, recall them that whatever they have taken, whatever not they have taken, mm -hmm. each and every time whether the reaction happened. If they say that five out of 10 times the reaction happened, that doesn't seem to be related. But if they say 10 out of 10 times the reaction happened, then it seems to be related. <laughs> try to narrow down to as minimum number of allergens as possible. For any allergy, any allergist, for any allergy condition, a maximum of six to eight allergens is enough. In the given case, which we are discussing, I think probably two or three allergens, that's more than enough to, uh, to test based upon the history, like the reaction happened to cake. So probably milk and egg, these are the two things which I would like to test if I want to test for the food allergy. And panels, definitely no. Because once again, there are not many issues, which uh, Sir has already discussed about the false positivities and many other things. I would add, I would test with the food that was actually given to that infant or mm -hmm. the child. Because I don't believe these commercial antigens. I would test with that particular food, whatever it is, go ahead and test. And then we look at all the different constituents and see how we can do go further. But you should test with that particular food that was given. Uh, Ankit, sir, any comment on uh, the different panels that are different mixes that are available in the um, labs? So you're on mute. So I think the basic rule is for food allergies, never try and do a panel. 
it will create more confusion than it is going to sort out your issue. So don't try and do a panel either in the immunocap or in your skin prick test. If you're looking at food allergy, select your allergens, do those allergens and maximum you can do cross-reactive allergens. So if you feel that, you know, uh, this cake had a nut, then you can do that nut and the cross-reactive nuts. Uh, you can do milk, you can do egg, you can do wheat and the other constituents which are there. So for food allergies, absolutely no panel is recommended at, at any point of time. Panels are only recommended uh, for aero allergens if you're looking at indoor and the pollens because at that point of time, you may not be able to tease it out. Uh, but that to a very limited panel as Neeraj has talked about it. I totally agree with the doctor. Panel causes more confusion than anything else because you will have a lot of false positives. And panels should be totally be discouraged for foods. If somebody comes and says, you know, I want my child to be checked for food allergies, never do that. A blood test. Go ahead and spend a few minutes to take the history. Never do these panels. Other thing is never do total IgE. So these different panels, nut mixes, fish mixes that are available in the labs, they cause a lot of confusion. If you get a nut mix that is positive, parents tend to eliminate all the nuts from the diet. While if we break the different nuts and do separate tests for the separate nuts, then we might just find he's allergic to just one nut and not all. So um, unnecessary food elimination from the diet is becomes common if we follow this uh, uh, mixes uh, testing. So coming to our next second, uh, the, going back to the case, this was the skin prick test uh, result and it was positive for egg. So this patient had egg allergy. So what, was the the what was the measurement? Sorry? What is the measurement of the wheel? So this was around... It's quite big. It is quite big. It was Very quite and as Sir said, we actually asked the mother to, you know, uh, bring egg. Uh, uh -huh. we, we use the commercial egg allergen, which is marked as E. We also asked the mother to bring and bring a raw egg. And we did specially for egg white and egg yolk. Because we totally agree with Dr. Vedantan that, you know, for food allergens, sometimes the quality is not good and it, it can degrade over time. Uh, so I think it was around 15 mm uh, reaction was there, yes. uh, uh, which, uh, which, was, which was quite a high reaction. Yeah, this is exactly what I was trying to say. 15, it's a huge reaction, you know. So if you get a positive, like a five millimeters, chances are you don't know what it is. But anything more than eight, you know, with the history is very, very suggestive of an IgE mediated reaction. This goes along with it. Very, very well done type of evaluation. Thank you. So, Ankit, sir, how would you manage this child? So, I think uh, a documented case of egg allergy, uh, parents should understand that, you know, uh, accidental reactions can happen. Uh, they should be very careful about reading food labels. They should be very careful about cooking food at home. When the child grows older, you will have problems such as, you know, going to play school and get exposed to certain other foods which the other kids might be bringing. So that is one important part of thing. Uh, the second part is that, you know, because uh, accidental reactions can happen, you need to have some allergy action plan in place. Uh, because it has led to anaphylaxis, you know, repeat reactions can, can be similar and they can be fatal. So... So uh, the family needs to be taught how to use epinephrine. I have heard that, you know, um, the auto injectors are going to be available in India. As of now in the commercial market, I don't think there is any. We would still uh, recommend, it, recommend using a preloaded epinephrine syringe. So use a 2 ml syringe. Don't use a 1 ml. It is very flimsy. Um, loaded at this age, I think 0.15 milligram should be the correct dose. Load two syringes, keep it in a place which is uh, not exposed to light. So keep it in a 
either in a pencil box or in a, a spectacle case, you should always carry it. And you need to, you know, teach parents how to use the allergy action plan. Can I add one thing, doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, if you look at the natural course of egg allergy, about 75 to 80% get better by the child is about five to six year old. So a lot of them get better, just like milk allergy get better on its own. It's a spontaneous resolution. Same thing happens with egg allergy. They get better as they get older. So you will have to avoid, like just like the doctor was saying for the first few years, along with other precautions like epi and all that. But gradually the mom will say, you know, you know, yesterday he just took a little bit of a cake and he was okay. The child is like four year old. That indicates that the it is naturally it is resolving. So this is something that we need to be aware of, and it is not a bad idea to do yearly prick skin testing, yearly specific IgE for in this case for the egg, so that you follow that, and that is called immunological regression, not progression. It's regression, and that occurs on a natural. We really don't know why this happens, but it is very good. It is happening. So that child, by the time he'll be six or seven, will be able to handle egg products 80% of the time. So how do you do that? Can, you, can he go ahead and start eating egg products? No. And this is where you go ahead and do the oral challenge. Oral challenge is So we'll be covering not... that in the yeah. rest of the presentation. Yes. We'll be going to that. Yes. Sorry to stop you in between, but no problem. So the management treatment involves three things. First is allergen avoidance, which has to be followed meticulously. <laughs> Dietary substitutions to avoid any nutritional deficiency, especially if a child is allergic to multiple food items. And then reintroduction, when to do it, how to do it. These are the three main prongs of treatment. And then, of course, avoiding any life-threatening episodes. So we have to inform the school, inform tuition classes that this person, this child is allergic to so-and-so food item. They should have an epinephrine preparation with them at all times. Parents should know how to use it. And there should be an allergy action plan in place, which clearly mentions what are the signs that the caretaker or the child has to look for. And in case of any such signs, first inform the uh, they have to inform the parents and the local authorities they and they should know how to use the epinephrine what is the dose of epinephrine uh, for that child all these things should be clearly indicated in the asthma action plan and should be there in the child's school bag when he goes to school uh, deepak so this question is for you what is the natural course of egg allergy so I think uh, we have just discussed, uh, sir has told uh, just few minutes back. So uh, egg and milk allergy are most common. And I think uh, six, 70 to 80 percent of milk allergy settles as this graph shows. 78 to 80 percent of milk allergy settles by two to three years and around 80 percent of egg allergy settles by five to six years. So I think milk allergy settles very soon as compared to egg allergy and unfortunately peanut allergy persists for a long, uh, longer duration as compared to milk and egg. Is there a difference in this, uh, in the natural course of food allergy when it comes to Ig mediated reaction and a non Ig mediated reaction, sir? Uh, so IgE mediated uh, reactions, they tend to persist for a longer duration. And fortunately, in India, we uh, see more of non IgE mediated, and the chances of uh, non IgE mediated settling soon is high as compared to IgE mediated because it has an immunological memory. So, the chances of persisting allergy is more. So, at what point, this question is for uh, all the panelists, at what point in the course of the disease, like a child is diagnosed with a particular allergy uh, in infancy and he's following milk, is following the elimination diet and he, everything is going as planned. At what age or what are the clinical ind indicators where you would want to test the patient there and then? Because we don't do the Ig mediated uh, in vivo or in intro test for all food allergy cases. Taking CMPA, we don't do a IgE test for all CMPA cases. We have an infant with CMPA. We put the child or the breastfeeding mom on the milk elimination diet. 
what are the indications clear indications of testing a child for uh, food allergies when it comes to in vitro and in vivo testing so uh, if we just take an example in this particular case so there was a clear cut history of anaphylaxis and we understand that if by chance a re exposure or re introduction happen then at that time that might be once again life threatening for the child so it becomes very very you can say like uh, necessary that this particular child needs to be investigated as you rightly uh, said about the skin prick test in this particular child and dr vedantan sir said about the immunological regression so what you need to do is that you need to clearly see first that whether the immunological regression has started or not if the immunological regression has started and you have documented okay initially it was 15 and now gradually it has reduced to probably 5 6 or so then now this is the time that we would like to go for the next step of doing for a challenge but this challenge once again should be done in the controlled conditions preferably in the hospital setup where all the emergencies including anaphylaxis can be tackled so but uh, uh, in this particular child only like anaphylaxis was there and we have to we cannot start directly any challenge we have to first go for the immunological regression means the safer test first and the safer test will be the skin prick or the specific ig which will be more safer see the trend of the immunological uh, values which are happening once they come you can say like lesser then you go for the uh, more riskier test which is the oral challenge test i think i think this applies to uh, mostly older children and most of the times we have uh, infants with cow milk protein allergy and in which we have diagnosed the kid based on mainly clinically and we have not done any testing so what we follow is that we uh, keep the child on cow milk elimination diet for around six months or till one year of age whichever is later so if suppose if we diagnose the child at four months so we keep the child a uh, cow milk eliminated diet till one year of age and suppose if we diagnose the child at eight or nine months or ten months then at least we keep him uh, cow milk protein free for at least six months and then uh, uh, we try uh, the same protein. Uh, can I comment? Yes. Uh, one thing about uh, challenging, you know, first you need to do baked foods, baked foods, because baked foods is where the protein is a uh, little modified because of the heat that is used during baking. And that's a lot safer way to introduce baking baked food as a challenge first before you go to the actual food, like the milk or the egg. Yeah. So how, when and how would you reintroduce egg, so in this patient? So I think uh, uh, means like the panelists have uh, discussed about this concept that when it should be done and why it should be done and how it should be done. So as mm -hmm. Sir has rightly mentioned that the baked items are relatively more safer as compared to the partially cooked or uncooked items. And we will come to that uh, later uh, part that why it is like baked are more safer uh, rather than above. So to summarize this discussion, we for reintroduction, we reassess at six months or one year of age, whichever is later, as Dr. Deepak already pointed out. And in case of nut allergy, we reassess at two years. For two years, we keep them on an elimination diet. Gold standard to assess tolerance is the oral food challenge test. And specific Ig testing can help us guide the timing of the oral food challenge test is what we have discussed in this part of the panel discussion. Now, this particular child is somehow is not growing out of uh, his allergies. Can we do some tests to understand whether this will remain for life or whether the child is going to outgrow this allergy? So here, if you, if you uh, just go back to the history once again, and let us revisit the history in which this is a one-year-old child who has developed certain sort of anaphylaxis. That means the reaction was definitely very severe. And then when you tested, then at that time, the egg reaction was quite big. So it seems that probably there is some egg protein, or I will now rephrase the sentence, component of egg protein, which is actually having, you can say like a bigger reaction, capability of doing anaphylaxis. So right now, before challenging this particular child, I, I will be interested in knowing about a question that which particular egg protein component this particular child is, is having a, you can say like a immunological reaction. So the, the components could be heat labile component or the heat stable component. So he, the, the same, same story goes to even for the milk also. 
So in milk also, there could be certain uh, heat labile components and certain heat stable components. So the logic behind that is that suppose if the child comes sensitive to heat labile component, then at that particular time, it is likely that when I heat that particular food, that means I bake that particular food to a certain temperature for a certain duration, then the allergenicity can be reduced. And that's why Dr. Vedantan mentioned about that the baked challenge because they are lesser allergenic. So, so I would like to start with the baked one first and it is likely that the child should be able to tolerate the baked one where the allergenicity is reduced if it is due to heat labile protein. Whereas if it is due to heat stable protein, then at that time, even if you are going with the baked food, there are chances that the allergenicity might remain same and at that particular time, even the child might react to that also. So that particular information, I will be able to get if I test component, which is component result diagnostic. Uh, for instance, in this case, like when we are talking about egg, so there are two, uh, you can say like the components, which are common one is ovomucoid and ovalbumin. So ovomucoid is heat resistant. So suppose if I come to know that, okay, this particular child is having ovomucoid component as a problem, then at that particular time, I know that probably the baked egg challenge this child is also not going to tolerate, probably, right? So I will be more safer. I will start a little later. I will start with the smaller doses. I will be more gradual. I will be more cautious. On the other hand, if the child is not having a heat a stable component problem, that means ovalbumin problem. On the other hand, a let's say ovalbumin. So ovalbumin is heat level. Then at that particular time, I can start the the challenge, oral challenge earlier because I understand that it is the baked egg that should solve the problem. So I can start a little bigger dose, frequently increase the doses or intervals can be smaller and I can jump up the things a little faster. So this can actually gives us an idea about the prognostication, uh, about the egg and the milk. On the other hand, if you're talking about some other foods like this slide is mentioning about peanuts. So in peanuts, once again, there are different components. So there are certain numbers, fancy numbers, which are given two, three, six, seven, eight, something like that, in which there are few components which are having, you can say like strong allergenicity. And at that time, it is likely that a given child might come back with a very severe reaction or anaphylaxis later on, on an accidental exposure. So this particular child will become a candidate for EpiPen, even the first time of the OPD visit or second time of the OPD visit, even if there is no previous history of anaphylaxis. On the other hand, I uh, mean, it's like EpiPen prescription. On the other hand, if it is because of RH8, which is more like a, you can say like a very, very minor allergenic component, then at that particular time, not very much worried about the, the anaphylaxis and all those things. So, so before doing component result diagnostic or component testing, I should be having a very clear question in my mind that what question I want to answer with this particular test, then only I should proceed. If I don't have that particular type of question, please do not proceed because it will add to the confusion rather than giving you the solution. Very true, sir. Thank you for beautifully summarizing this, explaining this topic of component result diagnostic. It is a new diagnostic modality, not very um, easily available uh, in our country, especially. So it is not routinely recommended. It is only recommended in few cases where we are unsure of uh, the allergen that we have tested positive for. We When we want to differentiate between a true sensitization and a cross-reactivity uh, sensitization uh, in our test, when we want to uh, find out whether what will be the natural course of the disease in this particular patient, especially in children who are who have severe symptoms. So what this test does is it tests for a specific component of that allergen and uh, gives us a list of uh, components in that food allergen. So since we are discussing egg allergy, <clears throat> there are two main components in the egg um, that is a ovomucoid and ovoalbumin. Ovomucoid Although it is present in less quantity in the egg, it is the immunodominant protein. So a patient with high uh, ovomucoid level will probably have more severe symptoms, will probably have an uh, allergic reaction for life. And if we get an ovomucoid test positive in a patient, we will be a little wary of introducing egg in that patient. We won't be very hasty even do, doing the oral food challenge test. Versus if a child is positive only for uh, ovoalbumin and not for ovomucoid or has a very low ovomucoid level, then that tells us that the patient has a better prognosis. Natural course of the disease is more um, reliable, is more uh, in the favor of the patient and we might he might be able to tolerate baked eggs since it is the more heat uh, labile uh, component. So, 
basically component testing tells us answers these questions whether we should reintroduce now or wait for some time how severe the child is going to have the reaction and whether the allergy is going to persist for life and uh, or resolve earlier so this is a very new testing modality still not very easily available but if available to us can add answer a lot of questions that we face in face in clinical practice while deciding the treatment if if the, the, if the crd is not available on spit test is still good yeah uh, so next question in this case in uh, is for uh, ankit sir and that is can we consider oral immunotherapy in this patient and uh, when should we consider it and for which foods so you're on mute yeah so i think uh, uh, this is a question you know which is upcoming which has been asked to uh, you know, by a lot of parents to us, you know, can you do something? They read on the internet and they come back to us. So, uh, I think what I understand, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Vedantan for what is the new thing. Uh, what practically I understand is that um, uh, for most of the foods, it is still into an experimental domain. It is standardized still for a peanut allergy. What we now understand is that if you do peanut desensitization early, then you know the results are better. That is what I understand. Still not very um, very clear for the rest of the tree nuts because it's not standardized. Milk and egg, what I understand, and wheat, because uh, there are chances that you know that it can wane off, and eighty percent will phase out of it. Uh, we can still wait around six for them to grow out, and if they still persist to have then there's a chance to uh, you know consider the immunotherapy but the the logic of doing an oral immunotherapy is to give them some protection against accidental challenges because not all would be able to take uh, the food in adequate doses that is what i understand about uh, oral immunotherapy but as, as of now uh, we don't have any experience so uh, i'll just hand over here to dr vedantan and then ritika will have to wind up because it is already around 4 5 or 4 10 and yeah. then we can take up some questions from the panel. So, Dr. Vedantan, sir, what is your take on... Uh, just keep it very short. Oral Thank you, doctor. Oral immunotherapy is a risky procedure. So, we have to be very careful when you do this procedure. There is significant amount of education of the family, of the patient, if he can understand, as well as the staff is important when you do oral immunotherapy. It is a potentially a dangerous type of procedure because you can have acute allergic reactions during this type of procedure. So oral immunotherapy is standardized, as you were saying, doctor, for uh, peanuts. I have never done for eggs so far. Okay. We have done for peanuts a few cases, but the reason why you do oral immunotherapy is not like, unlike the immunotherapy we use for inhalants and all that here, it's only for accidental exposure, accidental exposure. If somebody is highly sensitized and by accidentally takes a small piece of that cake or whatever it is, or like, we, know, we know more about peanuts, say like they take a couple of uh, peanuts, like two or three, two peanuts or, or maybe half of the peanut, they are protected because oral immunotherapy for peanuts, we know more than eggs. For peanut, each kernel of peanut is 300 milligrams. So oral immunotherapy will protect you for three to four kernels, about 1200 milligrams, which is very, very rare for anybody to accidentally take three or four peanuts. They may take a small piece of it during a party or they chew on a chocolate, which has got peanut as a contaminant or a constituent. And if they get and uh, oral immunotherapy will protect them. So oral immunotherapy has helped many families to overcome that anxiety that goes with foot anaphylaxis. You know, if you have a patient with foot anaphylaxis in your family, you understand it is not just the child. The whole family is nervous about that particular foot. So it is a very difficult uh, situation and in the domestic uh, uh, arena where when you have a child with anaphylaxis for foods because yes. the whole family has to avoid it not just the child so coming to oral anaphylaxis 
oral immunotherapy it has got limited usage i would not be very free i would not feel free to go ahead and introduce that uh, procedure at this stage and uh, i would basically educate the patient as well as the provider about that the what oral is the status for uh, milk and egg oral immunotherapy? Uh, do you yes. do it? You know, it is gradually getting acceptable and not yet standardized. Okay. But I don't know, although in India, <laughs> cases where they have, they have reports where they have done many of these things, many of these challenges, not for accident and exposure to introduce these foods on a regular basis. On a regular basis, they take food. That is not the indication for oral immunotherapy. That is not the indication for it. So there has been erroneous reports coming from India and uh, studies where these foods are introduced on a regular basis. And that is the uh, error in the message that has been coming out, out of these uh, studies. So we should be careful when you analyze these uh, data that is coming out on oral immunotherapy, because people tend to usually jump on that wagon with any anything new, they jump on it and try to experiment it. And that is the major issue with uh, any of the tests or procedures. So oral immunotherapy is a definitely a risky procedure. I would not feel very, very uh, enthused in introducing oral immunotherapy right away unless it is standardized. Yeah, I guess standardization of allergens is a problem when it comes to SPT, when it comes to oral immu uh, immunotherapy. Problem. So I think there is some loss of connection from Dr. Ritika's side. Uh, I know it is a very interesting panel discussion. I am highly obliged to Dr. Vedantan sir for joining us here. Uh, we unfortunately have to come to an end of this panel discussion. Uh, we've already shot over time. And we can, you know, do um, something more on food allergies uh, later at some point of time. So we'll have to give five minutes to the audience for asking some questions, uh, if there are any. So anything in the chat box? There was a question about age of introduction of egg yolk and egg white. Like whether it should be introduced by six months, nine months, or twelve months. What oh, is recommended? I would like to take <clears throat> four to six months is a good window. Yeah. So I I totally agree with uh, sir. So basically, if uh, it all depends upon that for what purpose you want to introduce. If you want to introduce routinely, that means you do not want that the child should be uh, allergic. So as a preventive method, sir, yes, absolutely right. Four to six months. On the other hand, if the child is having proven allergy, uh, is as in our case. Then at that time, I think sir has already highlighted about the fact that you need to wait for somewhere around one and a half to two years of age. And then thereafter, you test them as per uh, the discussion which we have done. And thereafter, you can introduce. So I think, uh, you know, introduction of this the, these allergenic food should also be in sync with uh, the national guidelines of exclusive breastfeeding. And, uh, you know, overzealous introduction of all these allergenic food at four months so page sometimes may not be very easy. At this stage, I want to thank you as well as the people on the panel for just uh, including me. I was not supposed to be on the panel, but you were very gracious enough to allow me to be on the panel. I want to thank you for uh, the uh, gesture so that you took. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. This is a very, very important topic. I'm glad you are doing this for the pediatricians across the country. Thank you so much. I need to go now. 
And again, I want to thank Neeraj and the whole group. I'm sorry, I don't know all the different names, but I really want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. There is another question. Any children may outgrow egg and milk allergy. Should we wait or offer oral immunotherapy? That is what we are trying to say that, you know, it might appear more fancy to talk about immunotherapy, especially mm -hmm. oral immunotherapy. But most of these things have not been standardized as of now uh, until you have better answers, like right? till you have a better standardized protocol better safety measures, better availability of the allergens, still most people would agree that uh, it is not the standard of care. Most of these... Right? So just going in for oral immunotherapy, it is not something which is easy. As Dr. Vedantan says, you know, if you do oral immunotherapy, during that process, the chances of anaphylaxis are quite high. Right? So, you know, uh, and still you do not have legal protocols. You you go across, you do some sort of immunotherapy on your own whims and fancies. The child gets an anaphylaxis. The child gets admitted to a hospital and you get into a trouble. So uh, as of now, what I understand and I would advocate is that, you know, till you have very clear protocols which are set in, don't do things which are, you know, out of the box. Uh, so yeah. I would like to, I don't hear uh, one, one observation which I have seen. So I happened to uh, be for one month in Chicago, so in July. And there the center is Center for Food Allergy Asthma and Research. It's basically a total entire food allergy center for the world, right? So I have seen Palforgia, which is the peanut oral immunotherapy to be given in front of me. I have seen those packets uh, in my hand. So what it is exactly, so this Palforgia or the <clears throat> peanut immunotherapy, these are the, you can say like the red colored capsules, which are there and in which the, the measured quantity of, uh, you can say like the peanut, which is there as Dr. Vedantan was mentioning about 300 milligram. So if you just see the protocol, like it is something like uh, we used to get for our tubercular medications. So the strips, so the same type of strips which are there. So, okay, so for one week or two weeks, this is the first strip. If the child uh, tolerates it, then, then the second strip comes, then third strip comes, then fourth strip comes. It's like that in the escalating doses. So when they are doing this peanut oral immunotherapy, so they are doing both the skin prick test, they are also doing the specific Ig, and thereafter they are also doing the component result diagnostic. And in the component result diagnostic, they are trying to, you can say like, look that, okay, which particular component this particular child is having uh, allergy to, like RH2, 3, 4, or probably 8. So what I have uh, observed is that those children who are having positive RH2, 3, means like RH2 and 4, which were uh, supposed to be highly allergenic, so they were also reacting even to palforgia, even to the peanut oral immunotherapy also. So what they used to do is that they used to uh, keep more intervals between the two doses. They used to start with the lesser dose in those particular children. Still the children were reacting. Then they used to come back to step down one step or two step, wait for some time, and then once again step up. So, uh, so what I want to say is that, yes, definitely it is a risky procedure. And they all children are usually admitted inside the hospital is a daycare and, and the parents have to understand everything they have to sign everything and then only they they, they are uh, these procedures are done it should not be like okay you are just probably tested positive so you should start doing this thing it should not be taken as like that okay and maybe last question for the day what should be the age of cow milk introduction in infants so uh, uh, this question I would like to answer. So before that, I would like to answer one one more point. There is a there is a belief that if suppose some infant who is supposed to be having milk allergy, whether it is a uh, proven allergy or a suspected allergy, and if the child is on breastfeed, then the mother's milk, the top milk, is also avoided. The mother, the the lactating mother, is also devoid of the the uh, milk or so. So the recent editorial which we just wrote for. Uh, clinical and experimental allergy, they have clearly given an algorithm that if the child is having a milk-induced anaphylaxis, proven, or if the child is having failure to thrive, which is attributed only to milk allergy, and there is no other attributable cause, these are only the two indications in which mother should avoid her own dairy products. Otherwise, 
the mother can consume dairy products and she can continue with the breastfeeding. So this is one point which I wanted to say. The second point is about the top milk. So we these all guidelines, whatever we are discussing here, these all have been made by the Western world. There, the problem of infections is not there. Just, just remember that we belong to a country where infections are still predominating. So breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding is very, very, very essential here. So four to six months of exclusive breastfeeding must be there. After that only, you should try to introduce whatever you want to try to introduce. Okay. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat box. Dr. Ritika, would you like to give some concluding remarks? Yes. So uh, can I share my screen again? So what we've discussed today is food allergy is an upcoming and a very under-recognized problem in India. It is coming, we are getting more and more cases of food allergy, especially CMPA, so we should know about it. Proper allergy testing should be done to confirm the diagnosis. We should not just assume and take parents' history and uh, take that as a uh, positive test. We should confirm our diagnosis, especially when we are dealing with a child with an IgE-mediated um, allergy. Uh, dietary counseling is important to maintain nutrition. Unnecessary food elimination is quite rampant and that leads to nutritional deficiencies. So we should, if we are putting a child or the mother on an elimination diet, then we should look at other substitutes that need to be added to the diet for which we can involve a dietitian or we can do a dietary counseling of the parent and uh, the child. And there is a, a there is a need to develop a food allergy service or clinic in our country since we we since this field of uh, medicine is upcoming, it is growing at a very fast speed and we we have a large cohort of patients of allergy who needs to be who need to be catered properly another thing is that recently in 2023 itself the indian milk milk ladder has been introduced which uh, where um, how to reintroduce uh, milk items in a child with cmpa has been um, uh, explained properly it comes it has six steps and uh, we have we should start introducing from step number one it basically the concept is we introduce milk in a way that a very small quantity of milk is introduced first and then we gradually keep increasing the amount of protein um, and at the end at step five we introduce the milk product in a raw form like paneer or cheese and final step is introducing plain milk so this paper is uh available and if you need it I can circulate it to you and it is very good because uh, this is something that we need to train the mothers of children <clears throat> with CPA with while reintroduction. So I would like to add one line sorry Ritka, I am I'm stopping you in between so okay. one line here so uh, we need to really understand that allergenicity what allergenicity means it depends upon the protein conformation and it also depends upon the quantity sorry, of the allergy. So our aim here is the milk letter is. Our aim ah, here in the milk letter is that we want from the lesser allergenic to the more allergenic. That means lesser allergenic means lesser quantity, more towards more quantity, as well as uh, lesser allergenic means more heated, more changed, and then to the lesser heated. So they initially have gone to 180 degrees Celsius, then they have, you can say, like reduce the duration of the cooking. Then thereafter, they have gone to the simple, you can say like boiling. Then they have gone to the fried. So in this way, they have tried to, you can say like increase the allergenicity gradually. And thereafter, at the last step, they are going to the full milk. So this is the basic concept. And then they have enumerated that in the various steps. But the basic concept for any particular food item is from the least allergenicity to the most allergenicity in a gradual fashion. That's the only thing. So these concepts are very well explained in this particular article and you can go through it. And I think this summarizes everything. Last thing is oral immunotherapy or any kind of immunotherapy should not be done loosely without having proper indication for it, one. And second, you should know about what you're doing because these are not um, to be taken casually. These are very serious. It, it has very serious implications. So immunotherapy for food allergens is not very routinely done. It can be done, not very routinely done. Most of our cases don't need it because they outgrow allergies. But if they do, then it should be done by a trained person, by a specialist who knows what he's doing. So thank you so much for a patient listening.
we i think all the allergens can have a discussion for as long as they want there there is never enough time to discuss food allergies because it's such a vast topic thank you so much over to you dr swati thank you dr vitika and i thank all the panelists dr deepak dr neeraj and dr ankit special thanks to dr vidantan for uh, a valuable input to the discussion and for those who have and uh, thanks to all the participants also for those who have missed the recording of this session will be available at blkpediatricpractice.com and the link will be circulated and on behalf of iip central delhi and blk center for child health i conclude this meeting and uh, for the next month we will be coming up with another interesting topic so stay tuned thank you so much thank you everyone thank you Thank you. Thank you so much.